Thank you. I'm delighted to introduce yeah. Ray Anderson and Lee. Lee, what last name do you go by? Kathleen. Kathleen? Kathleen? Yes. Kathleen. Oh, okay. <laughs> if I looked, it would be good. You're getting me. Anyway, I've been reading about land calves for years. And even before I moved up to Sonoma County from Marin. <laughs> And they've accomplished a great deal in the 26 years or so. 25 and a half, you guys basically said. Lee and Craig are true partners. I was impressed to see how they work, how they kind of play off each other. And Craig has been quoted when he, when he was the Bay Nature hero. How many years ago was that? He was, uh, a while. A while. Yeah. <laughs> Probably Obama. <laughs> okay, during that period. Anyway, it's, that's quite an honor to be chosen as a local hero by Bay Nature. And in fact, another land pass staff member, Omar Gallego, um, as was this year's choice from in environmental issues. So they've accomplished a lot. And all of you, I'm sure, have gone on land pass walks. You've visited Bayer Farms, which has a lot of programs. You had kids who have participated in activities. Both of them have background, academic backgrounds in environmental studies and environmental planning and biology. They both traveled widely and done fascinating things. And um, Craig had a very nice description he told me about that, that was in Bay Nature, although I haven't seen it, about their working relationship. And he describes himself as the leaves on the tree fluttering in the sun and Lee as the trunk and the roots. And they argued a little bit about that, but it seems like a rather nice description for a very good partnership, a very fruitful partnership. So I will turn this over to you too, so that you can carry on. Can you hear me? Or is this just for the um no, can you hear no it's no it's can you hear it? We can't I can't hear it. Or you can hear it. Oh, we check that. <clears throat> Did I give him the hand? Should we give him the hand mic? No, Karen might just need to with the switch <clears throat> volume up would be wonderful thank you First off, um, thank you very much. Can we dim the lights so that those who uh, Got up really early to have an opportunity to have Can a little bit of a nap. Snow yeah. Well, yeah. well. And if there's any yeah. um, people that are techie, uh, in particular some of these younger folks that know about Zoom and how to get rid of that share screen thing, you're welcome to come up and help me do that. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll dive right in. Um, and just as the, for those that I don't know if uh, anybody complains about the sound, this, but uh, um, could be louder. Be an hour with the mic. So hence the uh, there's the programmatic director of the conversation, and so we got to negotiate quite a bit on uh, on many things. Um, so uh, we were asked, I was asked, was asked to uh, speak a little. Is it? Oh, there you go. Thank you. Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry. Um, on on our the, ongoing journey towards equity, and I was thinking about you know. Milo, Milo Baker, CNPS, CNPS or, or let's see if I can get this. Oh, now it doesn't want to respond. 
Oh, I don't have to do that. Come on. Okay. Um, um, oh, there we go. Perfect. There it is. Thank you very much. And, and your name is? Yeah. Yeah, all right, Jack, stay there. Okay. Stay close. Um, I was thinking like CNPS. What about salvation through California native plants? So SCNP, because I think we need some salvation right now um, in lots of ways. Um, one of the things I like to model is. Um, I appreciate, uh, especially communities of color, they don't necessarily come out first with their degree or the name of the talk. They introduce themselves, they introduce their families. They make, they, they, they focus on relations. So um, I was, I'm from the Bay of Smokes. That's what the Chumash, the Gabrieleno people called it, uh, otherwise known as Santa Monica originally. Uh, my mom's folks were from the North Coast. I spent, I spent my really like my early years in Yosemite National Park and Tuolumne, I got lost at the age of five for like two hours. They were starting to run along the Tuolumne and the Lyell Fork looking for, a, you know, a floating five-year-old, but I was instead listening to marmots uh, behind the uh, group campsite and becoming just stunned by nature. And so after that, it was it. That was it. So I, I never could get away from nature after that. Um, when I moved to Sonoma County many years ago, I became a, a hunter of non-native species, uh, only, that is only turkeys and pigs, something I learned up here. Uh, play a little bit of music. Um, and then Lee and I have, of course, they're a little older than that, this, that now, um, but two kids. And there's Lee and I on a trip some years ago. Lee's in the back. She's our program director, as Virginia mentioned. Um, and really what we do is, we, last 25 years, we have this incredible opportunity. It's not always easy. Sometimes it's stressful because uh, there's different competing uses and there's neighbors and there's lots of issues, but we get together with groups of people and we envision how we can work together to protect what is currently open space or agricultural land and keep it in open space and how it can have multiple benefits to the community. And sometimes like here at Rancho Mark West, put in a garden, drop in a spring and a summer camp for kids and a school's program during the year, and uh, there can be a lot of beauty. Um, probably about 10 years ago, I'm way back in the back right there, I had an opportunity, and I just want to, this is part of the theme of our talk tonight, um, but this was a very sobering experience uh, to be part of the uh, Native Land Trust. It was apparently the first time my friend Peter Forbes, who's in the middle there in the back with a goatee, Peter put together this group of, uh, of 10 to 12 Native elders from across the country. So, you know, Chesapeake Bay to Tofino Island down to San, San Diego and Acoma Sky Pueblo. And, and then 10, 10 of us, you know, non-Native, mostly white uh, conservation professionals from across the country we met for three days. And uh, Rand Wentworth, he's the third in from the left. Rand was the president of the Land Trust Alliance, which is, as far as we know, the largest conservation organization federation in the world, has an annual conference of 2,000 people. And we were all talking about our conservation heroes, and the white people went first. And Rand said, well, John Muir is one of them, you know, and Ralph Waldo Emerson and, and Rachel Carson. And, and later on, one of the native, uh, the, you know, the First Nation people said, John Muir, not so much for me. He, uh, he advocated for extermin exterminating my people. So right then we realized getting into the conversation, uh, we might have different values. We might have different stories. And uh, it's not always easy, but it's important to talk. So uh, just go through a few caveats and background. Um, I'm going to try to give you, um, and we're, we're going to start with presentation and then, and then Lee and I would like to address any questions or comments you have. Um, but we're going to start with just sort of a breadth of what Lampaz is, because some people have seen a slice, maybe gone on an outing, or they've seen Bear Farm, but may not know about the totality of what we try. And I, I, I emphasize try to do these this, this first 25 years. Um, so we're going to provide that. Um, we're certainly looking at thinking about this theme of diversity, equity, inclusivity, DEI. Sometimes it's called JEDI or justice, equity, diversity, inclusivity. There's lots of buzzwords. Um, I mess them up, acronyms all the time. But we started in 2002 because um, there was two, two reasons. One was it was the right thing to do. It was the fair and loving thing to do. 
And secondly, we knew it was good for the planet if we had more people involved um, and we could reach, you know, reach everybody. And, and now, you know, 21 years later, um, that's all true. Plus the planet is, it's in peril. Um, I think we've all been watching with horror in some ways, the things that have been happening in the last few years between drought and, um, and floods and, and, and fires, of course, and, and how climate change is, it's, we're playing a number on, on mother nature. So we've got to double down. Uh, it's important. Um, just to, again, a little bit of bio here is as a young graduate student, I ran into David Brower and uh, I asked him for advice after a talk he gave. Some of you may know who David Brower was, the president of the Sierra Club. He kind of took Sierra Club International and made it about advocacy and not just about wonderful opportunities to go hiking with people. And uh, I asked him for advice. You know, should I do environmental law? Should I become a biologist? Should I do policy? And he just, this giant man looked down and just said, fix it. And it took me 20 years to figure out what he meant because I'm slow. Anderson, Scandinavian, I, I have to think about things. What David was saying is, doesn't matter, kid, what you do. Just do it with your heart and fix the, fix what's, fix the problem. Um, so related to that, Lee and I like to say we're, we're not experts in any way. We're just practitioners. We practice. We make a lot of mistakes. Um, and that, you know, this is not a solicitation trip, just building awareness. Um, and humor at least keeps me going. And I'll tell you, we had, we had a really lovely full Chinese dinner, uh, thanks to Virginia and others, uh, before this. And so a number of us have a lot of food in our tummies. So I have to like humor to keep people awake. So, um, and I promise there's 33% more salty language included at no extra charge as part of this talk. Um, and yet some of them might get home from this talk and say, you know, they didn't really talk about corcus. I didn't hear him say Madrona much, because um, I probably won't. But we're going to talk about our organization really and how we are trying to reach, you know, the whole community. Um, and again, these are these are just opinions. These are perspectives and anecdotes, and your results will vary, um, like because you know, we're all human beings. Um, but I'm hoping to share a little bit about our work. Um, yeah, and the pace may wear you out at some point, um, and which will explain why it's been 25 years since we've spoken to you, and it may not, it may not, it may be that long until we come back. All right, so jumping in on the mission of the land pass, mission is very simple: foster a love of the land. And uh, what we try to do is provide these experiences to people that are transformational for them in the outdoors, and and ideally ben that benefit both land and people. It's pretty simple. We do that several different ways. We provide access to land. We try to engage youth and all people, people of all ages, and ideally um, provide people the opportunity to act with nature in mind. So yeah, being outdoors is a tool. And again, I'm a really simple person. I believe that, I mean, there's so many, there's so much bad stuff going down right now. I mean, just listen to NPR or read CNN or whatever your news is. and. And again, I'm simple. I think we've just gotten, we've abstracted ourselves from land. We've extracted ourselves from nature. We've extracted ourselves from relationship with other people. And when we have relationship, it's really hard. You know, I mean, when was the last time, unless you hurt yourself, when's the last time you went outdoors for a walk or a bird walk or just to, you know, to go try to ID all those ferns that plague me. He went out on a plant walk for a few hours up in Annadale or somewhere. And you came back and someone said, did you just have an awful day outdoors? But, you know, wasn't it just horrible? It's like, no, it's, it's, really, it's, it's really hard to have, to have that happen. And I think we just need to give opportunities for more people to have time outdoors, falling in love with land and nature and falling in love, therefore, with each other and themselves. And I think we'd have world peace. So that's my simplistic worldview. Um, of course, this is when I talked to David Bauer, um, and I was very fortunate to spend some of my grad school with, with David and Ann in Berkeley. You know, he would talk about, you know, lasting conservation is both legal and through, and through, and through cultural change. Because David used to say, you know, that the thing we save this year is always threatened next year. So we have to continue. So how do we do that? It's not just by having it written down. It's that we the culture, that our, that our community wouldn't allow something to be taken. And I think we're making some grounds there. When you have a, you know, a, a young woman from Sweden who goes around the world and, um, with Tourette syndrome and preaches climate change, 
Uh, I mean, she's pretty remarkable. I think the kids got it. Um, it just, I just hope that we can get the job done before we lose too much in terms of biota. So there's the, there's the old fashion of like, you know, when, when Brower would fight against the Glen Canyon Dam or people would fight against, you know, Maxam Corporation and, and Pacific Lumber back in the, I guess that was the late 80s, early 90s, there was always the threat. And it works, mostly. But it doesn't get everybody. And that's why, and it's in big font, what Lampaz really tries to do is we try to focus on what are we for, you know? It's really hard to come up against somebody from a completely different political ideology than you when you get to Cloverdale and you're face to face and you just say, I'm for clean air and those kids having an opportunity to go and pick strawberries and then spend some time around the redwood tree. I mean, what are they, what are they gonna say? No, that's bad. Um, so it's like, we really try to be, we try to put our hearts out and be for something. So we, Lampaz is a values-based organization. And so we really, we try to center our work around our values. And um, uh, the, the woman that I, I drove with tonight, who I've been working with now for almost a quarter century, uh, whose name I won't use, uh, is really helped us go through this um, exercise a number of years ago to really focus like, like what are our values? What are the Lampaz values? Not, not just nature, what is it? Well, it's lead with nature and to foster a sense of belonging, especially with young people, so important. Is this too loud, by the way? Okay. It's to build reciprocal relationships between land and people and between people themselves. To cultivate a common purpose. There's two more, act with courage, and sometimes really important to nurture joy. All of those things are certainly available to us in spades when we when we are in in and on land outdoors. So a few more things. Um, what do we do? What's our approach? Well, we invite people to discover their place. It's the commons. It's the rebirth of the commons. It's, it's not the state park that's owned by the state and we're going to pay our fee and we're going to walk around and just look at the trees and not talk to any of this. Our place. When we had Willow Creek, which I probably won't be talking about, we really introduced people to Willow Creek, gave them a permit, gave them the combo and said, this is your land. This is your place to take care of. It really makes a difference. Um, again, we talked about that sense of belonging, providing our kids and grandkids with a sense of place. Um, to, I mentioned the commons already. Um, we really have been working over the years to engage more teenagers. I think teenagers are, are like a threatened species because we other them and we're scared of them and we send them to the mall down by that big white hand at 4th Street. Go, you know, go in the mall, go buy things. But um, they really need to be outdoors with us. Of course, we're talking about tonight engaging people from you know, diverse ethnicities and cultural groups and just different ways of being and different ways of, of, of communing with land than ourselves. Uh, we try to invite others beyond those with lots of dollars. We try to work with everybody and we certainly try to engage our elders in our work. So um, I'm just gonna, just a show of hands, um, who was young someplace east of the Mississippi? Who was, who was young in Sonoma County or Marin County? Couple people. Um, how about Southern California? All right, for those of us that put our hands up, think about that place where you were young, is it still there? Is it still largely intact? Is it still inspiring people? And if it's not there, can it come back? So these are our fundamental program areas to which we deliver our mission with, and we'll go through these. Uh, rooting youth in nature. Uh, most of these are multi-visit uh, field-based education programs for young people. Secondly is community stewardship which is about stewarding lands of both public agencies like Bear Farm, Healdsburg Ridge, Fitch Mountain, um, but also lands that um, land paths quote owns. We don't, we try not to use the own word. Um, we're just, we just see ourselves as the stewards. Um, and then lastly, branching out conservation, which is what we're gonna spend a little bit of the time on. So first our, of our three-legged stool, rooting youth in nature. Um, it's just great getting, as we all know, I mean, if you want to connect with a community, um, it's get the kids involved and certainly 
getting kids outdoors is just, I mean, it's been done for thousands of years. Um, it's where they should be. Um, and so we've had this program, one program called In Our Own Backyard started in 1999. Uh, it's, I, and I can never keep up with the, the most recent statistics, but these are approximate. Um, and this is actually soon gonna change because of a grant we're helping uh, the Community Foundation administer getting more kids, if not all, all grade school kids out into nature in Sonoma County every year. But it's run with volunteers and classes. And basically the premise is we connect kids to land near their school. It's, 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 they adopt that place, they treat it like theirs. They have some sort of a stewardship project. Um, we have staff, it's free, it's Cal Science standards based. We provide the buses and the whole nine yards. Um, and, and it's and now that you little, that, I just love this photo, it's from years ago, but um, her name is Paige. Paige is probably like a graduate student now at this point. But um, every part of the, the program at IUB is they get a sit spot. It's like, it's like Thoreau, it's like Walden. And, um, and so she wrote, you, maybe you can't see, but it says, what I see from the eye of my sit spot, which, you know, she's, she's drawing in perspective or she sees the world, not sure. So another thing we do is we do, um, we start na nature immersive camps, summer camps. Now there's spring break and winter break camps as well for kids. Can you, thanks Jack. Oh, it was one down. Let's hear it for Jack. There'll be more Jack. Thank you for staying there. Um, that's much better. So anyway, I said John Burgess. I love this photograph. This is at Rancho Mark West, one of our summer camps. Okay. Let's get this back. Paige? Uh, I don't know. Do, do, do you know do you know her? Yeah, she's a medical student now. How old is, how how old is she? Oh, you know, she's in her do you know where she went to elementary school? Okay. Do you know where she went to elementary school approximately? Let's say yes. Actually, I would love to, I'll follow up with you, Jan, about that. That would be really interesting to find out. Um, another one of these, uh, and this is something that Lee started years ago, is uh, we do uh, high school treks. We do treks for adults too, but we're trying to basically over the long term create trekking routes across Sonoma County where you have local food. If you need to, your gear is taken for the day in a, in a pickup truck and dropped off for you, but you actually walk or kayak across the county. And the kids here are going from our Bohemia Preserve uh, in above Camp Meeker all the way to the ocean over three days um, by Goat Rock. Then there's a teen program, teen camp for kids to, uh, teens to kayak on, on the river from Geyserville down to Monterio. Sometimes they go all the way down to Jenner when the wind's not blowing 40 miles an hour upstream. Um, and it's, it's multiple nights and it's, it's just magical. Um, now I'm gonna, before I go to the next initiative, so we just done Rooting Youth, I'm just gonna blast through a few of these slides because this is what nature does. I love these quotes, I'll just let you read them. Um, these are actual quotes from actual children in Sonoma County. And this is the grove of the old trees right here. Oh, sure. Well, just uh, for those that can't read it, we found a fairy home, a real one. The grass looks like the ocean. If we can see another path, can we take it? Look at the falling leaves, it's like glitter. Before I came here, I didn't know there were trees in nature, but now I know what nature is all about. Wow, look at the clouds. I've never seen anything like it. I actually haven't either, outside of Utah. Um, I feel like you can never get bored in nature. Student, can we go home? Chaperone, you are home. Student, I love this home. And this, this is remarkable, because these are like 12 and 13 year old boys. We made this only using natural paints. That's at Riverfront Park at, at uh, on the Russian River in Windsor. What time is it? Adventure time. 
I like that you can eat everything. That's at Bear Farm. These are the days I love being a teacher. And that just kind of says it all right there. Kid's got some little larvae on him. I got a free mud bath today. That's Colgan Creek, actually, down below Taylor Mountain. Can we come here tomorrow? I just want to get dirty, even if I really am into fashion. I love this shot because it only takes like one person, maybe two at most, to change the nesting materials and clean out a bird box, cavity nesting bird box in the fall. But, you know, if you're kids, you want to get like seven or eight involved because why? Kids love to have a role. They want to do something that, that, that actually means something. I can see the whole world. That's uh, looking from north from, uh, uh, what is that trail? Uh, Jacob, Jacob's Ranch. Oh my, it's so soft here. Everybody lay down, and they did. That's, um, that's Snow Land Trust property on the Estero Americano. Okay, moving on to our next initiative, community care. Um, of trying to create meaningful connections between people and between land. So people-powered parks, that's something we could talk at some length about, which I won't spend time other than just saying this one of, the, one of the reasons LAMPAS was formed by our County Ag and Open Space District originally um, by Carol Hart, Dee Swanheiser, and Sandra Perry, so back in 19, uh, early 1997, is open space needed help with some of these lands because California State Park System was foundering financially and did, couldn't take them on, so we decided we would, we would help steward these lands with volunteers. So the very first one was the Grove of the Old Trees outside Occidental. Uh, secondly was the Riddell Preserve up in Healdsburg in Dry Creek Valley. Then, then came along Bohemia Preserve, with, that's a partnership with Sonoma Land Trust and the, the Moore Foundation. And then Rancho Mark West is just, just to northeast of Santa Rosa off of St. Helena Road. Don Redwoods is, um, is a project we're working on. It's basically uh, next to the airport. It's the old Laughlin Ranch. Uh, and it's, that's an, another story if people are interested some other time. Fitch Mountain, which we took ownership of, and then by agreement, we, we did a bunch of stewardship work with teens, uh, reduced fire danger, and then four years later gave it to the city of Healdsburg. Ocean Song, where Jan um, and others have worked as volunteers. And there may be something coming next. If you want to talk to me later about next, I can tell you. Um, this was an article from uh, New York Times, not a public park, but a people powered one. This is uh, the beautiful, some of you are really into native grasses. This is called the panhandle out in Bohemia and there's extreme endemism out there. Um, you're looking at Sergeant Cypress and Baker Manzanita and other things. It's a really incredible piece of land. Stewardship for us is a, it's a family affair. It's all hands and it's especially hands that have never had the opportunity to be involved in uh, mostly native plant uh, restoration, planting, of course, pulling exotics as well. Bohemia Preserve, right off of Bohemian Highways. It's a remarkable piece of land. We're, we're proud to be able to partner. Um, this is called the Sound of Music here at the top. Um, you can see why. Um, we partner with the, the parish family next door and in total we have a thousand acres in common and they allow us to bring our programs onto their private land next door and they come across um, to our land as well and help us take care of it. Uh, this is the Grove of the Old Trees outside Occidental, our very first property. Um, and for us, stewardship is a, it's a long-term commitment to place. That's just how we, one of the ways we define it. Uh, the Riddell Preserve, K. Riddell on the bottom right case, passed away since, but it's 400 acres of wildness just above Dry Creek Valley. It's a stunning place if you've never been. Um, Madrones, it take four people to reach around. Um, part of the stewardship is, I mean, for a long time, we've been, we've been pulling brush and doing fuel ladder reduction and burning piles. And when we first started doing this 10, 12 years ago, people thought we were nuts. Like, what? You're an environmental group. You own chainsaws? Why do you do that? It's like, well, it's weak. Fire suppression, we're part of the, we're part of the ecology here. We don't hear that as much anymore. Um, 
one of the things too about our preserves in terms of stewardship is just spending time with each other at these lands. So we'll have a work day and then sometimes a dinner or some kind of an event. Um, and darn it, you know, people that are even pre-COVID that spend a lot of time with Netflix or Hulu or not talking to somebody else because we're afraid of each other, you get them outdoors with a hot cider and a few fire pots and, um, and here you can see this, the chairs are stacked up after the dinner. You think, then people don't go home. They just want to stay there because they're relishing that time of being in community. Stewardship can just be building a fairy house with, with little ones. Okay, our last part of the stool, and this is where we'll get a little bit into the DEI work, is um, how am I doing on time? I'm afraid I don't want to try to get a... Am I doing all right? Okay. Um, you can just... Start clearing your throats loudly if we're getting towards the end of our time. Um, so branching conservation out, engaging people with land. This is Bohemia Preserve. And actually that was a, um, this was a walk that was being led by my very dear friend and birding mentor, Ted Elliott, um, some years ago. So um, LAMP has at first was known for these, this outings program we, we founded with the Open Space District back in 1998. And we were just leading trips. This is Cooley Ranch, which is an incredible ranch up, up above Lake Sonoma. Uh, has the headwaters of the Navarro River on it. Um, really a remarkable place. And we were taking these free trips all over the place. And then first it was hiking. And then we started doing a little bit of multimodal, taking people kayaking. Um, this is a 14-mile hike. And the gentleman that's on the bottom left, you can see behind the second person hiking with the straw hat is Bill Cordham at the age of 83, hiking 14 miles in the day, starting on the Cordham Trail at the north end, up and over Coleman Valley Road corridor down to Salmon Creek, a really remarkable walk, really trying to stitch together open space. But we realized, you know, um, these were fun, but to kind of cut to the chase, um, everybody looked like us. You know, we were kind of, preaching to the choir. And it was neat to go out and see open space that we all helped protect, but uh, there was something missing. So the final leg of our three-leg stool is, is reaching out to what we call new audiences. So in terms of DEI or diversity, equity, inclusivity, um, this is work for us that started 20 years ago with the question, you know, who's missing from our outings and how do we include them? And frankly, it's a question we continue to ask ourselves today. One aha moment in the midst of all this is that, and it's hard, is it is not about how do we get more people to do just what we like to do, but how do we expose people and introduce them to our resources and understand through their cultures or their ways of being how they like to connect with land. And that's, that sometimes is a hard lesson for us Westerners. So in the midst of that, we've had lots of failure. Um, you know, at first we started translating outings. We got a few uh, public service announcements on the local radio stations. We hired Spanish speaking guides. We were doing the same things that we'd always done just in Spanish. And I remember we had, one week we had, you know, we had like two people that showed up for one of our hikes where if we if we advertised it in the PD back then, we would it would have been oversold with 40. So we realized that we didn't really quite have it yet. We had to, some things to figure out. We did get a grant from the California State Coastal Conservancy in 2002 to help us with our initial de uh, developing a diversity and diversity studies. And um, it was a great start. Well, beyond just hiking then, we started taking trips to local farms. This is Wayne and Lee James at Tierra Vegetables, a wonderful farm just north of Santa Rosa. And we did some early walks just in Spanish. We did walks, what we call for slow movers. Um, that is Peter Levesque there, the incredible, one of the finest field naturalists that I have ever met in my 61 years in any, any part of the world. And just an incredible naturalist interpreter. Uh, we started working with, this is L. Frank. This is up at the, just in the Windsor. There is a dog bane preserve that the Ag and Open Space District protected. And so we, we started to really, reach out to, to have other voices besides our own taking us and leading the community. And of course, um, we do, we do, we did a, 
Izetta Feeney was a volunteer for many years. She's now in Arizona, but she really focused on seniors and the seniors might walk 200 yards in the course of their hike and then just sit and picnic together and tell stories. This is at our Bohemia Preserve off of uh, Bohemian Highway. So some more aha revelations we had along the way. We needed to be the ones to change, to see connecting with the land in a much broader concept. In other words, it wasn't just about indoctrinating people that were different from us to be just like us. Um, we, knew, we knew we needed to be relevant and we needed to find a project that would change us. And so in 2006, um, I was very fortunate to be then touring around the city of Santa Rosa with acting city manager, uh, Mark Richardson, and he showed us several properties, and we came across the property owned by Bill Cordham's uh, fellow student at uh, UC Davis, a fellow named Fred Bear, and, uh, and now that's part of organizational history, and that property is Bear Farm. So we started in 2007, um, and we really we went into the process, we didn't have a thick binder with a plan all sketched out with wonderful drawings about what we were gonna have necessarily 10 years from, we, we went in with, as Lee likes to say, we didn't go in with a plan, we went in with a purpose. And we tried to go in with our values and also go in mostly listening and not telling people what we were gonna do. Um, we did have some backlash, I'm sorry that I, didn't save the letter about from 16 years ago from someone in Petaluma who said, if you don't stop translating your newsletter into Spanish, I'm not going to send you money anymore. So, well, okay. I looked, I looked at our database at the time and only we were only getting $25 from Petaluma. So it wasn't a huge loss, but I'm sure that's changed. Sorry, Petaluma. Um, okay. So this was the very first day we, we literally, um, this is the end of the day on August 10th. We cut a hole in the fence because the property had just closed escrow. Um, we'd showed up that morning uh, with a rototiller. We had bought one oscillating uh, sprinkler at Friedman's that, that, that watered in a wheel to, and around. So that became our first garden. Um, uh, Cap came with Youth Build, and there's Magdalena. We'll talk about Magdalena in a moment. At about nine, and we got some uh, really cheap starts from Harmony Farm in Sebastopol. We got we had broccoli and radishes, and that's what we planted. And that's we didn't know anything about being community gardeners, but some of us had been growing a, a little bit of food. And I was so impressed by this young man taking this care. I mean, he had never planted, I don't think, anything in his life, and he was just he was dedicated to this. Um, so after the first year. It worked out so beautifully and the community came and people started signing up to be community gardeners and help us take care of the property. I think Wendy was out there the very first year with us, along with a, our friend Michael Presley, looking at all the, um, the sheep poo that was in the barn and helping us till it into the soil and uh, advising us. Um, and uh, I have to say, I love this photo. It's my late mom and one of our staff at the time, Linda. Um, on one side are um, these uh, Mexican fiesta flags, like these, these plastic flags you can get at the market. And, the, and on this side, these are prayer flags from Tibet. But from a distance, they look the same. So Bear Farm just grew. Um, and then we were fortunate to hire J Jonathan Bravo. That's Jonathan on the upper left. He's been with us now 10 or 11 years. He was a teacher actually in urban Mexico. He was a math professor. Um, and, and the more the garden grew, the more groups came. I just love the photograph I took on the left years ago was the Redwood Empire Chinese, um, dragon dancers next to the little girls with ballet folklorico, um, sharing the stage at different times. And then after the, the show, we had the Kamal going with handmade tortillas and food from the garden for everybody. Uh, we had a fiesta there and I'll never forget hearing Supervisor Gorin say, I have never seen the word Roseland and thrive together in the Press Democrat. We had a, our first big festival a year in, we had 600 people show up. Um, and it was important to have a corn maze for kids that wasn't in Petaluma. 
So, uh, and this one didn't cause traffic jams, by the way. We had a slow food picnic there the next year. And um, I, I think 200 people showed up. It was remarkable. And we had the, just the cross section of ethnicities and languages. And this is one of the quotes I heard. Um, that's, you know, Efren up there, Shirley Zane and others. I bet this is what the first Thanksgiving felt like. So Bear Farms has been a, it's been a huge learning lesson for us and just an opportunity to invite and learn and be with the community. And the community has built the Bear Farm. Um, but that's just, you, you need an organization with the structure and if you will, a little bit of political clout, possibly a little bit of money from a community foundation or unrestricted donations from donors to make it happen. Just like CNPS, you need, you need an organization that has that, you know, it's, it's, it's entity, it's structure to help make these things happen. It's the Aztec dancers at Bear Farm. Um, more kids cooking. Um, and it's been really neat for Lampaz, this, this you know, conservation organization to get involved in food growing too. So it just from there, Bear Farm became not just to end in itself, but a portal for people in the urban environment to go see other places where we worked and go to other properties protected by the Ag and Open Space District. This is from a slow food day. We had $2 tacos, teenagers helping pick, pick tomatoes. There's uh, Gary and Mary Balsarak who live in Ro Roseland. They were one of the first people with plots in, uh, and Gary helped establish the native garden there at uh, Bear Farm, which is still there to this day. And I just love this photo. That's Scott. I don't know if Scott's still living. This is, you know, 15 years ago now. Uh, Scott was a Vietnam vet, and he was the first volunteer that I knew that Lampaz had that smoked cigarettes. And I just really love the fact that we had a volunteer that smoked cigarettes. I would also always be upwind from Scott when I was talking to him, um, but he just loved to come and weed whip the bear farm early in its early days. There's Jonathan with some of his younger volunteers. Jonathan is, has been a phenomenal ambassador for our work at both Bear Farm and Andy Unity Park. So a little bit more on some of the steps um, with regards to how we got there and how we're continuing to, if you will, um, make ourselves available for working with diverse communities. Uh, we were very honored to hire Magdalena in 2007. And as far as I know, she was the first Latina or Latino that was full-time working for a conservation organization in Sonoma County, for nonprofit at least, in history. Um, what took us so long? But uh, boy, she came in and, and she got things done. She had relationship, and it's really important to invest in people like that because Magdalena can tell a much different story and have much different relationships than Lee or I could have. And yeah, she didn't know anything about farming. She grew up in Roseland, and she'd never been to Montgomery Village when we met her. She stayed in Roseland. She stayed in her community. She really, I mean, I think she said she drove by, but she didn't really know where it was. Um, very, you know, in, 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 in this place that she loved. Um, Magdalena started, you know, learning um, and helping the, the organization transform. And she started a program called Vamos Afuera, which means we go outdoors or we go out together. And it's still going strong after 10 years. And so here's people that we originally got to know through our schools program or from the bear farm that are now coming out because they feel welcome to see these other places. The Grove of the Old Trees, Bohemia Preserve, Going Kayaking, Taylor Mountain, Bennett Peak, Saddle Mountain, et cetera. Um, I, mean, I mean, between the schools programs and the different outings and stewardship events, we have more, we have more outings that we you know that have, have in a year sometimes days in a year um this is was lovely to see the aztec dancers coming to do a cultural celebration of spring at rancho work west this is before the glass fire luckily the barn is still there after the glass fire um i was i was at the at the uh, college avenue y watching cnn uh on a hamster machine when at Christmas time, when the news came across of the Sandy Hook Elementary massacre. And my first thought was, someone's got to do something about that. 
And then the little voice on my shoulder says, no, idiot, you need to do something about that. What can Lampaz do? So again, simplistic mindset, but let's get teenagers who are the ones perpetrating all these different, at the time, there's the, all these different mass shootings, and let's get them to hang out together. And let's get them to stop othering other people and being scared of other people or, or being hated by other people if they just spend time outdoors together. So uh, we, we unearthed a program we, that Lee had started years ago, and it had been called Adventures in the Big Outside, basically IUB for teenagers, but now it was for, for especially for communities um, underrepresented in the outdoors. And um, I love this photo because um, these kids look tough. They're from Southwest Santa Rosa. They look tough. But what you don't know is they had just finished a trust walk, which is why they have those bandanas. They were taking themselves, they're taking each other on trust walk and, and they were just goofing around. And one of the boys apparently had never been out of urban Santa Rosa. And he told our instructor, I've seen trees, but I've seen them in lines between the sidewalk and the street. I've never seen a, a, a forest like this. And, and then he added, and you know, I'm a really good math student. And then he said this, after one trip, I know that I want to be a natural scientist. That's pretty powerful. That's what nature does. Oh, I almost got emotional there. I got to be careful. Um, these, are, these are a group of young people that were helping us do fire control work on Fitch Mountain. We've had various youth teams um, and internships. Lynette, you were an intern in what year? That, is that you? Oh, far out. There you are. I didn't even plant this photograph. What year was that? Eight. Wow. Wow. Um, so, and this is, yeah, I, again, I, I, I'm kind of a sen sentimental guy. Um, this was what was told to Omar by some of the community gardeners at Bear Farm. They basically said, this is a paraphrase, you know, we love it here in Sonoma County. We feel welcome now. We feel safe. And now we want to see that great American park as you have made us feel welcome and feel like we're Americans. So it was, I don't know, Lee, has it been four or five years? Do you know? For Vamos, uh, Yosemite? And so um, this is from the trip in October of last year. Uh, we now do a year, an annual trip where we take residents from Southwest Santa Rosa to, to Yosemite. It's pretty incredible. So some of the take homes from all this. Um, well, first off, we, we, were, we were hooked at the start, realizing um, this new understanding that was being created, not only for people having an opportunity to have access to land and, and, and food growing and learning about natural environment and being involved in stewardship and feeling welcome, but how they were helping our organization grow in its complexity and its depth and frankly, its heart. We were no longer just a quote, conservation organization. We were a community health organization. So we went back and did additional trainings with a, there's a great group called Youth Outdoors down in uh, East Bay. There's a group called Fierce Allies in the city uh, that my board chair and I took a diversity uh, workshop with uh, over a number of months. We've recently been working with Edutainment for Equity, which I believe they're in Oakland, um, South Berkeley. Uh, all, you know, we've continuing to train ourselves because it's never done. Um, there's always more to learn. And we started reviewing our internal policies. You know, how do we hire? Do our college degrees required? How much do we pay? You know, if you don't have a land trust, can you afford to work here? How do we, how do we figure out that offset and actually fundraise more so that we can pay people a really livable wage? Um, and what time should the board of directors meetings be? You know? If we want young people or people from diverse backgrounds, are we gonna have them at two o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday? Probably not. So it's, it's, it's in other words, it's a real reckoning with, with how we do things um, if we wanna make ourselves more available um, and more of service. Rethinking transportation, how do we get people? Because not everybody's necessarily gonna have a Prius or a Subaru Forester. Um, what food are we serving? Um, there's so many questions and there's so much to learn if we avail ourselves. 
So we've realized that, you know, the more diverse we've, we've become, the more we've learned and the more we've needed to change. It ain't easy. Um, it's not easy. But a little, just a little story on the, the Tubbs fire. Uh, our family was evacuated from our, our North JC home down to the Astro. And uh, the fire burned up on one of our properties. It burned the, burned the redwoods. The redwoods are now sprouted. They're epicormic growth and they're, they're looking beautiful again. Um, and the fire stopped this coast, this, oh, I am using Quercus agrifolia. Is that right? Betty, is that right? Is that right? Okay, Quercus agrifolia. The, the, this coast live oak saved our, our, our kayaks. Um, yeah, it's pretty remarkable because I was talking to the CHP when the road opened. He goes, oh, oh, they're up there. Oh, sorry, kid. They're gone. I'm sure they're gone. They weren't. Um, that's just not long after. Nature is resilient. What's beautiful, and and then I and I could I could get I, and I may get choked up telling you this. Um, the conversation went like this: the morning after the Tubbs fire, I met Jonathan at the front gate to Bear Farm. He says, "Craig, I want to tell you that, that the gardeners are saying they understand that people in your neighborhood lost their homes." People in our neighborhood in Southeast have not lost our homes. We are, no one was burned out of their apartment or their home or their townhouse. And they would like to care for your neighborhood. And th this is wild, because this is like, what, four or five months after um, the great orange one was elected. So if they had reason to not want to welcome the stranger, as the tradition goes, it would be then. But what we did then is we created Meal and Heal and we put up a pop-up kitchen in Bear Farm and we had food donated from around the county. We had, who, did anyone come to have a meal? Did anyone, anyone out there come to that? It was, it was remarkable. Um, we had chefs from Healdsburg that came and we cooked round the clock for two weeks. And so we, we gave out probably 2000 meals. Sutter, Kaiser came with, 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 you know, dust masks and giving out toiletry kits and, doctors and nurse visit. It was really remarkable. Um, mothers, aunts, uh, um, ab abuelas, grandmothers were cooking these incredible pots of local food, making fresh tortillas. We had a pop-up camp because schools were closed um, up at Rancho Mark West. That looks like Susan Gorn. It's not, but we had, uh, we had grandmas come and, and tell stories and it was really quite lovely. Yoga teacher came. some teens. I love that shot. That's, uh, that's the headwaters of Mark West Creek. All right, so to close, um, evolving leadership, evolving the board of directors. And um, again, I, I literally, I am the leaves on this tree because um, the trunk and the roots on this, I mean, there's, there were staff and board involved, of course, but uh, my partner, Lee, who's with us tonight, was the architect on how to help usher in an evolution of the board of directors. Um, so the more diverse we became staff, trusting the organization and felt belonging, the next horizon really was our board. It was time to go from a lovely group of people that looked just like us and where I was the youngest, and I'm 61. Um, it was time to really look across generations and backgrounds, ethnicities, cultures, ways of being. Um, and we had tried years ago. We tried to diversify the board by, you know, finding a candidate, just the right candidate who wasn't being asked by nine different nonprofits at the same time. Tell me that doesn't happen. Um, and then, they, but they didn't stay. And they, had, they all had a reason why they didn't stay. But in the end, it was it they there wasn't a culture on our board to provide for a sense of belonging for a sense of ease for a sense of conversation um we had no tr problem keeping white males on the board they stayed past their terms um especially attorneys um and if you want to get into conversation about well well craig i, I think the comma after bylaw needs to go beyond outside the parenthetical statement. It's like, ah, how can you get to meaningful conversations when you're chasing commas? Um, and I say that as a white male. So Lee had done some research. 
and worked with Omar from our staff and came up with the idea on the cohort to be comprised of individuals who already trusted Lampaz, either through our relationships or programs, and, you know, again, th relationship through Omar or kids whose families they come through Al Camp. And that's our summer camp. So they were recruited. Um, and they were recruited to come in as a group. And the Black Lives Matter certainly the movement certainly created another opening to have tough conversations with the board and with the organization. And so, um, you know, these these this group with Lee and, and two board members, they really worked to navigate how to approach inviting a cohort and forming a cohort and having them all come in at the same time. And Lee, that was five or six new board members. Something like that, five. And that included our current board chair, who is uh, Dr. Brenda Flies with Hawks, who is a, a Native American woman originally from North Carolina. She's a professor at the JC. Um, and the, the cohort would create a non-majority board, being, you know, over, over half of that board would be the cohort. So that cohort's now, we're I think in our second, end of our second year, um, they're now recruiting the next set of board members, um, looking at the bylaws and helping to move the organization forward and really volunteering in ways that I wish some of my compatriots, otherwise known as older white guys, could learn how to do. It's nice to give your opinion to staff about what they should do. It's really nice when board members get working on committees and work between board meetings to help the organization. Um, and there were growing pains. Some of those, um, some of my, some of my tribe didn't feel comfortable anymore because they were no longer the matrix. Um, and uh, so there was some loss because that's, that's part of, that's part of growth. So that is it for slides. Um, any, I'd love, we'd love to open it up if we have time more questions and um, maybe the lights can come back on if anybody has nodded off. I'm sorry. Oh, sure, absolutely. I, I might I might change them a little bit, but hey Gary. Hi Natasha. Um any questions or please, Jack. Oh, having the like institution uh kind of backing you know your grant requests and whatnot like really help how how does the how's the process in the beginning when you know you don't have that notability or credibility and how are you able to work with getting grants and whatnot so if i understand your question um how in the beginning do you have anybody the question how do we um if you don't have track record yet how do you kind of get it going with a with a grantor um Lee, would you help me with the answer to that? Start small. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think, you know, like for instance, Bear Farm for us started with one, one board member donated $7,000 so we could buy plant starts and irrigation equipment. So we started, we started small. And then, you know, but yeah, I think starting small is really the way. Um, Starting small, and I, something I learned years ago from um, one of my mentors in nonprofit work was um, start with kids, start by and connect things like connect trails, connect lands, connect people. And uh, if you can um, add some fun and food in there, those three things and health, those are magic. Any other, any other questions or On May the seventh uh, at the uh, Rancho Mark West, uh, good people are going to gather and do a road cleanup on Saint Lena Road, uh, nine till noon. Uh, you're invited to bring along a little snack, and people stick around afterwards. Good time, good fun, and cleaning up the road. May seventh. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions, comments. Pushbacks, Virginia. I forgot my microphone. Um, it's exciting to hear 
the developmental process you guys went through. I mean, it's the, sort of the ideal in so many ways. And uh, the organization and the community made it happen. So, because it, it's, and it really is impressive and it's inspiring because it's something we're just starting to look at. How do we get more people involved so that, that they feel it's relevant? And you've set a good example for us all. Thank you. It's team yeah, it is. Did you, do I remember from the start of your talk that after you were leading all these open hikes with all these people that looked like you and decided something was missing, did you sit down with your board and discuss the, what your goals were as an organization? Nah. <laughs> um, no, did, we can't, we didn't, we did, no, we just did it. Yeah. Well, Lee's shaking her head. I think what we did, Karen, is that we, um, we just emphasized fun, you know, and relationship. And then, I mean, it sounds so mischievous. If you're, if you're connecting people and people are having fun and they're doing good things, you can't go next month at the board meeting when you report these things and you show a few nice photographs, they smile. It's really, a lot of it's about sales. And we're selling, you know, like, I got to tell you, I mean, this is hard for all of us to hear, but like, there's a company that sells these tennis shoes and has a little swoosh. And some of them, at least till recently, were made in sweatshops and they're made out of petrochemicals. And they've done a great job selling those for a long time. And we're selling, I mean, Native Plant Society, Lamp has, and Sonoma Land Trust, Ecology Center, we're selling clean water, uh, native species, um, biodiversity, the planet existing, and humpback whales in 200 years. We don't do the best job. Set. We ought to be better at marketing what we do. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it was really, I think we didn't really have issues when the board saw us engaging more people. And the Ag and Open Space District was incredibly helpful to us in our early years. Please. We were, we were very naive. Um, we wrote an article in 2002 in our newsletter saying we're committed to this multiculturalism was the word then. Um, and we have no idea what it's going to look like, um, but we're committing to it. And that's all we know. And, and so we didn't even know enough to talk to the board because we had no idea the profound change we were going to go through. Um, we thought we would just lead different outings really at the beginning. So we didn't know enough to, to not try or to tell anybody what we were getting into because we had no idea. Because it, it does, it changes your organization. Tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, I'm sitting with, I sit on, because of Measure O funding on the Santa Rosa City Violence Pre Prevention Policy Group. And I'm the, we're the only nonprofit organization, only conservation organization there because we're seen as relevant to kids' health related to the outdoors. That's I think that's remarkable. Hey, Brad. Right. <clears throat> so, um, how do you measure your progress towards equity, diversity, et cetera? And do you ever get there? That is a great question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we thought we were there and then we realized, oh my gosh, we're so far. Um, uh, so um, so we measure it in part by, you know, our attendance records and where people are coming from, what language they're speaking. So so that's part of it. We're, we're actually uh, trying to develop a method to look at not only demographics, but the geographic distribution where people are from to try to get deeper into um, underserved communities and not just based on demographics, but geographic. Um, but it's also it just, you know, we, we have a very uh, kind of 
a culture of inclusion within the organization too. So we're constantly talking to our staff, constantly asking them, who's missing? Who do you want to engage next? We just did a whole survey with the staff. What's what are the next groups? Who are you? Who are you not seeing that you want to include? And because we have a diverse staff, we got a lot of diverse answers. So that's always the goal. That's always the next horizon. Um, and then trying to do the Excel spreadsheets um, and the data mining to make sure that we're we're advancing our targets. Great question. I'm just reminded too. I mean, it, and it's it just takes everybody because you. You have staff, you've got volunteers that are in the field, you have volunteers that are board members, you have Wendy that's been helping us with farming since, I mean, Clinton was in the in the White House. Seriously, that's how long Wendy's been with us. And of course, Wendy is an incredible volunteer in so many capacities. We have um, Karen and Dan's son, Nick, who was our GIS intern for years, who was just the sweetest young man. Jan's up at, at Ocean Song, and you've been with us for some years and various places. Um, and then of course was intern. I mean, it's, it's just, you just have everybody that helps in their own way. That's the neat thing about nonprofit agencies. I think is you allowing people to, to, to plug in as they want to plug in and encouraging that. And, you know, and if there's something there, they're going to find it. Any other questions or comments? Can I just read it? Okay, sure. Here we go. Um, uh, question or two about board diversity strategy. Did the cohort of BIPOC members make the board composition equal Euro to BIPOC, or is the Euro representation on the board greater in number than BIPOC, or uh, is there a plan to bring another cohort uh, onto the board in the future. I think I could answer that, but dun 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 dun. Here she is. And the, the intention with the cohort to have, um, I think they were referred to as the Euro folks, um, a, be a minority. Uh, we wanted not to have a, a white majority board. Um, and that the cohort would be diverse, so it would not create another majority on the board either. Um, so that's that was one of the questions. Was there something else? Like there was another part to that question, but I don't remember what it was. Um, well, it, we are you know, now that we've reached this non-majority uh, culture on the board, one, it's, it's been a wild ride the last two years on that, but now new board members are coming in and because our network is more diverse in recruiting those board members, it's, we're, we're just keeping that policy of a non-majority non board. You know, I, I just want to add, you know, it's, It'd be easily just be very pendular about it and say we're just gonna we're gonna have a cohort that's just that's people of color working with the you know the traditional sort of nonprofit Sonoma County Euro group. But what about we're not there? I mean, I want to get a rancher from Cloverdale on our board. I'd like to have someone a person of faith who who's a full time professional pastor on our you know I mean then we're really looking like we're starting to include everybody. So that just made me wonder about turnover because you mentioned initially that people came and left. It sounds like you still have a fair amount of turnover, which is hard in itself. You know, continuity on a board is pretty important. Um, so I'm wondering how that's being addressed. Do you have like a minimum term that you request? I think I know the answer, but I'll just say um, we've had way less turnover now that the cohort has sat and started to be to feel like it, it, you know, the 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 previous portion of the board and them working together, there's a lot of understanding. Yeah, I think the turnover that we had once we brought the cohort on was some of the what we might call the former the carryover board members realizing what 
the experience was going to be from then on. And the, when reality hit, they were like, okay, this is not for me. Um, but that was it. That's the only turnover we've had since then. Um, which that we expected that that would probably happen. So it's like the, 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 the horse kicks and bucks a little bit for the first couple steps and then, and then kind of you're on and that's how it seems. All right. Another Zoom question. Have you had to find different um, and perhaps larger sources of funding as you have broadened your mission and worked to be inclusive and connect with more diverse community besides Petaluma? Um, I'm going to walk back into Hilly again. Um, but I'll just say oh, my experience, because I a lot of what I do now is I do a lot of development work for Lampaz. If you're going to be around for 25 years, you better like you know, help the funding of the organization. And um, you know, going back to like 2008, like the year after we founded Bear Farm, and if you all remember that like with uh, George W. Bush, there was a lot of lights in downtown Santa Rosa businesses. They were shuttered. I mean, we were, they weren't talking about depression, but it was a hard recession. And uh, I tell you what, growing food for people in an urban area and providing access to land uh, in addition to like, you know, traditional land conservation, bucks and acres, but also health related to nature, that helped in fundraising. I mean, that was beyond just grants. That was like unrestricted donations. People saying, wow, I see what you're doing with this. This is powerful. So I think the question was, did your expenses go up? Uh -huh. And and they they did, but Craig said in some ways we we have more fundraising appeal because we can appeal to different sectors because of how diverse we are. So that's one hand, but we spend a lot more time on our programs, our recruitment, um, training. You know, with the teen mental, the youth mental health crisis, where we're training all our youth staff on. Um, uh, trauma-informed programming. So there's just, as you get deeper in deeper into these communities, you, the issues that you're working with are so different than our first nature owl camp. It's just, we have to, we're, we, we just have to learn new skills and be more prepared for, for what those um, experience, those kids are bringing those experiences to camp and how to manage it. Um, so there's a lot more, uh, training, preparation, planning that needs to go on. Um, so yes. So within your organization, there's a lot of interplay between community and conservation. Um, and it seems that you guys tend to favor the community aspect of that, which I highly respect and I think is a wonderful thing, but how, to, how do you develop and manage the relationship between the two and make sure that the conservation is still, you know, happening within this region. It's a great question. I have my thoughts, but I'm going to hand it to my partner. God, you, oh, um, yeah, it, it, we talk about this all the time because we do see ourselves as a community conservation organization. Um, and so it's a tension within the organization and every staff person would probably answer it differently. Um, uh, I don't think you can really address conservation without community. You, it, with climate change, it's just, you can't. And um, so, but I think sometimes we lean too far into community and not enough into conservation, but we think the win for conservation uh, is being done on the long road that way. Um, but it, it's such a good question. I would just add, um, and I really, I feel very, this is a great question. It's really visceral for me. Um, you know, if we just, I used to work for the Nature Conservancy before Carol and, and her friend started Lamp House. And, uh, you know, we would we would do some projects by hand with hand waddles and on the, on the McLeod River. And we would get a tractor to go out and excavate a stream crossing so we could replace a culvert that was eroding, the blah, blah. So I was wanted to be a repairing ecologist out of Cal. And you can get some work done. That's great. 
you have 900 kids in the school year that are going out and falling in love. You saw those slides and the things they said. If you're falling in love with Taylor Mountain and Bennett Peak and the Sonoma Coast and understanding why you don't pick rock pick abalone and and understanding that that they're voting with their fork when they buy food and they it might look cost a little bit more from Laguna Farms or Tierra Vegetables than it does at Whole Foods, but where that's coming from and how that 900 kids it's going to have a lot more there's a lot more energy than one excavator um and you know a few years ago i saw this young woman she'd come back she'd been in, in the in our own backyard school program that started in 1999 so it's 24 years started in 99 and so what's someone who's really good at math so when i started this job uh uh what's his name stephen curry was nine years old okay so or yeah um so some of those kids are, I don't know, they're in their 30s now. They were elementary school kids in 1999 or, or, or maybe beyond. That's scary. Um, but one, this young woman came, she was working at our, our camp program. And, and I said, oh, Lizette, it's so great to see you. You were an out camp. She goes, yeah, I was an out camp. And then I said, well, she goes, then I was, yeah, I worked there. I go, where are you at school now? She goes, yeah, I'm at Humboldt. Like, what are you doing? Environmental science. I'm like, why are you doing that? She goes, because of you guys, stupid. I mean, it's because like nature, I fell in love with, I mean, basically, so I, I, we have, we can't, we can't quantify it, but I can only imagine when you create that groundswell, I mean, that's how we, I think we get change. Um, does, and I, I love what opens, Ag and open, I mean, we need everybody. Ag and open space district has the dollars to buy on conservation easements, green belts and buys parks and, you know, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Sonoma Land Trust does transactional and restoration work on big signature landscapes. Laguna Foundation, of course, is taking care of the Laguna and in the, the learning Laguna projects and programs and working with us with SEEK. Sonoma Ecology Center is getting grant funding and doing a lot. Of, I mean, we need everybody. Pepperwood's doing, you know, grassland, Mediterranean. We need everybody to do their thing, you know. And then there's salvation through native California native plants or SCPN. I just wanted to speak to that question because I've been on a lot of the stewardship days and I'm very um, physical production oriented. And so, <laughs> yeah, surprise reveal. Um, so the day starts out with everybody sharing something about themselves in response to some question and sharing their name. And that takes like, you know, at least 15 minutes, you know, and there's me like, God, we could be pulling more. Weeds, you know? <laughs> and then, you know, at the end of the day, we do another question that everybody responds to. And what I've begun to learn is that that's really important because it really changes the nature of the energy, the work you might not get quite the same amount of work done, but it's done as a group. And that's really valuable. And so I really see merging those two things there. And in fact, I've incorporated it into my own thing. And I've I've kind of now made, well, snacks. I learned about snacks from you guys too. But snack time is a really important social time. And so we kind of try to make something out of that so that we get a group experience as well as just, gee, I cleaned four acres of weeds. Thank you, Jan. How about how about not only questions, but just people who want to share their ideas now? On the same note, I wanted to ask you, is your board on is it paid your board paid staff? And do you have social times for your board to meet where we're not talking about the budget? Ooh, those are can I take those? Great gold star. Um no boards are the board of volunteers no paid staff so we we've never been on the board we're not we're not voting members and yes if we don't do at least one fun thing for the board during the year then then we as staff executive staff aren't doing our job so one of the first things we did for the cohort was we had um it's right after we were able to purchase the two halves of ocean song that had been separated by 50 years and we put them back together so there's 800 acres now the myers property and the ocean song proper and we had um, we brought out a camp chef, camp chef grill box, and we had burgers, and the and the new board members came and they were just stunned. One of them was one of them got lost actually walking back to her car. We had to go find her, um, but that was fun. 
but no, it's really important to, we try to build in fun for our board um, and Lee's got some. And because of the way the, the cohort was brought in that the social dynamics was super important because again, we're a relationship based organization. So the board has organized, um, I think it's based on a Russian tradition called Troikas. I'm not really quite sure. Yeah. Um, uh, and that they, you kind of have to, get together socially with another board member and it rotates every month or something. And so it's to build those relationships um, across um, the board because a lot of them are unfamiliar with each other. And part of it is building bridges around through the community starting internally of our organization. So again, he takes having fun and eating outdoors seriously. <laughs> I think the main message for everybody is that until the general public, all of us feel that we're part of this whole system and it, it, it relates to us directly and we relate to it, that that's the only time you get preservation and and the kind of thing that you're establishing. And it's exciting. I think it's something CNPS can do a lot more of. Especially if we have staff. Yes. We do not. No, let's, but. Let's change that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got, but I think there's a certain amount that volunteers, a volunteer group can do. We have the, the state staff, but they're the only paid staff. So this is all, you know, I think partnering with groups, we could learn a lot from you guys. Yeah. Anybody else? Thank you so much for having us. Thanks to Virginia and Wendy and Karen and Lynette and, and Susan. Thank you. So, and Jack.